um, you, you don't really know them that well. So you kind of have the forming, storming, norming kind of thing. And this was our storming phase. So anyway, one of the early things that happened, this was, um, I was asked, our security team, I ran a security team of around 30 professionals. And we were asked to put um, wireless networks in all of the conference rooms in state government. And so um, at that time, that was kind of a cutting edge issue. Now, you know, everyone has wireless everywhere in their homes and, in you know, coffee shops and everything. But the reality is, um, you know, that that was a, a cutting edge thing at the time. And I was, my background was, you know, National Security Agency and we call three letter agencies in Washington. So NSA, CIA, DIA, FBI, and, and I had done my homework and I knew that this was bad, you know, security, you know, we couldn't allow Wi-Fi in conference rooms because it was, it was uh, going to be a problem. It was, um, it was not secure. And there were stories in the papers, there are lots of stories in the U.S. papers about people pulling into a Home Depot and Walmart, I'm not Walmart, but Home Depot and Lowe's and, and different uh, parking lots or car parks and, and hacking into cash register because the Wi-Fi's weren't secure. So I had all these papers. So basically, Terry asked me to prepare. We were in the staff meeting and it was like 10 of us in the staff meeting. And we got to that agenda item and Terry says, Dan, tell us how we're going to securely put Wi-Fi in all of our government conference rooms. And I said, um, well, Terry, I've decided to cancel this project. We're not going to do it. We're not putting Wi-Fi in any of the conference rooms. And Terry just looked at me with this stunned look, you know, and, and I have, you know, she asked everyone to leave the conference room but me. So it's just me and Terry looking, looking at each other. And I've never seen a government agency meeting end so quickly in my life. Because, you know, this was an hour long meeting. It was 15 minutes in and she just ended it. And she looked me in the eye and she said, Dan, if that's your answer, you cannot be the CISO in the state of Michigan. Basically, I was worried I was going to get fired. And I said, well, wait a minute, Terry. You, know, you don't understand. Let me explain. I had all these white papers and all this. You know, I was going to show her all my background materials about and articles and, and books about why this was a bad idea. And she says, no, stop. I read all those articles. I know what you're going to say. I, I know what you're thinking. But but she said, um, I've been to Dow, Ford, Chrysler and General Motors. They all have Wi-Fi in their conference rooms. What do they know that you don't know? And so they're like, tell it. So I'm like, whoa. She says, I'm giving you one week to figure this out and come back and give us a plan, not to, not to deliver it, but to give us the plan to do it securely or you're fired. So that was a real <laughs> scary moment for me, Makash. It was scary. I almost thought I was going to lose my job. I ran it's back to my team. That's an interesting try. Yeah. And I, I just have one more quick thing I'll tell you. I went back to my team. They were like, did we tell them we're canceling Wi-Fi? And I said, no, we're doing Wi-Fi. We've got to figure this out. So two years later, we actually win the award for top Wi-Fi security in the whole country. We, 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 but that really was a, a, a ground, a, a paradigm shift for me as a person. You know, I, that security needs to be enabling. They need to be coming with solutions and not just problems. Security pros can't just say no, can't do it. You've got to come up with a solution that's going to do security on time, on budget, with the right level of security. So that's my most embarrassing story. <laughs> Almost got fired, but it turned into a good thing. Terry and I are still friends 20 years later, actually, well, 18 years later. And now, Bakash, I want to know what your most embarrassing moment in your career was. <laughs> sure, sure. I, I, I would be happy to. But before that, um, so, so uh, did you manage to get fired? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I didn't. I kept my job. <laughs> but you tried. But you tried. I kept you my tried, job. Honestly. I did not. I did not get fired, and uh, it ended up being real a, a, a paradigm shift for me because I I started to think about security differently. And I, you know, when, whenever I had a security challenge, it's like who's doing this best? Who can we learn from? Look around. Um, and you know, state government is not known at that time certainly as one of the leaders in security. And, and like I said, the private sector was doing that better than us. And we learned from that, and we actually improved. We actually got better through that experience. Interesting, very interesting learning. I I, I believe that there's a, a a lot of interesting takeaway as well outside of uh, a very 
entertaining story for sure. <laughs> so uh, let me share mine. Yes, so please. This is quite a long time back. Huh? So almost like a couple of decades back. And, and as a kind of little bit prelude to the story, which is important, I used to do a lot of magic shows. I mean, long time back. And, and by magic shows, I don't mean the rabbit out of the hat trick sure. kind of magic shows, but more like the David Blaine kind of stuff, mentalism and um, um, uh, close-up magic and those yes. kind of stuff. I, I used to do on stage as well. So I was doing like opening shows for college fests and closing shows for college fests. So I'm doing, I, I was doing it at a pretty decent level. Uh, so, and, and also I started my first startup around that period. We were doing this um, automated penetration testing nice. on the cloud. So that was what we were working on. So uh, now I went for a visit to Paris to meet some partners and that, that was like a slightly gloomy day and a little bit of drizzles. And I remember I was walking down the stairs um, of, um, they call it subway, right? Yeah, subway, yeah. Like the underground, yeah, they call it subway. Yeah. So, uh, or no, they call it metro. Oh, the metro, I yeah. I guess the metro, yeah, yeah. They call it the metro, the underground uh, transport system. So in the US, uh, in the US is the subway. <laughs> yeah, US is the subway and London is the underground. Yeah. So I was going uh, down the stairs and there was a guy who looked like from East Europe, he came and told me that I'd like to sell this um, iPhone. Uh, iPhone just got launched. And uh, would you like to buy? And I was the Blackberry guy during those days. Yeah. So I said, no, I'm happy with my phone. So I was walking down and this guy still followed me and said, you know what? I need some money badly. And my sister is at the hospital. I need some money. It'll be great help if you could buy this and he eventually came down like he started with somewhere around few hundred euros and came down to some 20 euros and eventually he told me you know what i need it very very badly can you give it to me i mean i'll give it to you at 10 euros or something like that and here is the iphone and i'm also going to give you this camera a small no, point and shoot autom automatic camera and I took that phone and I swiped and everything was working fine. And I thought this is interesting because at 10 euros, if you get a device which is working in worst case, even if things are not perfect, we can go open it up and look into and use it for hacking. So sure. I found that <laughs> and I'm, I think I became a little bit greedy. <laughs> I wouldn't say I tried to help that guy. Uh, but I said, okay, here you go. I gave the 10 euros. He took this uh, iPhone and the camera, put it into a small brown bag and gave it to me. And I took that and he started running up the stairs and I opened this brown bag and inside that there were two potatoes. Oh, wow. <laughs> so right in front of me, he did the classic switch, which I, I, I was pretty well trained to do. Wow. He did that classic switch in front of me, and that was probably the most expensive pair of potatoes I have still, uh, I mean, I bought till date. That's a great so story. That had been a pretty humbling experience <laughs> being okay. a security professional. Um, I mean, uh, that reminds me to stay humble. That's great. Great, great story. So, so Dan, let's get started with some real crisis examples. Today's topic is handling crisis. Um, please share some some examples of some real crises that you dealt with in the past. Well, I've dealt with lots of them. Um, you know, when I was CSO, for sure, uh, one of the biggest ones was the blackout, the Northeast blackout of um, 2003. So. You know, we had just gone through the whole Y2K, and I, I, I started in Michigan government in 97, and, um, you know, I come from an NSA kind of top secret background, you know, and Michigan government was very different than that, of course. Um, not a lot of, you know, not a lot of, um, of uh, very uh, secure facilities, but the whole focus during those years from 97 to 2000 were, was Y2K. So we had prepared, you know, what if, you know, all the computers break, and we had done a lot of good work to prepare for that. 
Um, and that went kind of without a hitch, but we were all sitting there in the emergency center, you know, on January or, or actually, you know, December 31st, January 1st of 2000. Um, but then three years later, you know, we had, we had, we had, of course, two years later, we had 9-11, but not so much happened in Michigan. But two years after that, we had a, a large blackout in Michigan where uh, the whole Northeast lost power. For two days, basically, we lost power. And it was basically a situation where, um, you know, we had to all go to the emergency coordination center and respond to, um, you know, no computers, no power, no, um, you know, uh, huge issues. A lot of people thought it was, a, in the U.S., thought it was another 9-11. They thought, you know, it was another terrorist attack. And uh, all the people at the emergency coordination center, uh, we were there for four straight days in a, in a bunker with, you know, a generator. And, um responding to all kinds of issues that you know the state parts of the state came back to like 24 hours later other parts uh came back more like two days later and some came back three days later but it was a major emergency and, and new york was without power for a couple of days a lot of things happened you know, trying to get water from one side of the state to the other um some things you wouldn't necessarily think about like um re it was a very hot day it was like 95 degrees fahrenheit in the u.s and, and restaurants were having to close. There was no air conditioning, but they were serving spoiled food. And so like there, there were food, um, you know, uh, inspectors who were having to, you know, close restaurants because people were eating spoiled food in Detroit and, uh, and, and they needed the technology to support that, but they had no power. So there was lots of things we had to do. And during that time, I met tons of people who ended up becoming leaders in Michigan government over the next decade. The person I worked closely with was um, Colonel Etchu, who was running the whole emergency for uh, state police in Michigan. She ended up becoming the director of Michigan State Police. So in those kind of emergencies, if you're ready, if you're prepared, if you've got good plans in place, um, it can really strengthen your security organization to be prepared. That was not a hacking attack, although some people thought it was a hacking attack initially. Um, uh, and and but you know we responded to that and that was a real life emergency we responded to. That's interesting. That was very interesting. So um, I mean that happened due to more like a natural calamity, but that's something which I think all the all the nations today want to stay prepared for, right? So uh, Dan, uh, let's talk about some 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 of the drills that you have done and. Sure. Um, uh, so any of these large scale cyber crisis drills that you conducted in the government? Yep. Yeah. So what, one of the ones that I want to uh, mention was a, a, um, a series of drills that the U.S. Department of Homeland Security does called CyberStorm at C-Y-B-E-R Storm, S-T-O-R-M. And uh, the one I'll tell you about, the story I'm going to tell you is from CyberStorm 1, which was the first one. But they're now up to, I think, CyberStorm 7 is coming. They do this every two years. And these are global exercises. So, um, you know, they, they do them in you know, U.S. states. They use federal agencies in the U.S. But I you know the United Kingdom and France and Australia and New Zealand were all part of these exercises. So this was a global exercise. We were the first one. And my team had prepared. This is a week-long exercise. It was a not everyone on our team, obviously, but it was a large group of people. And um, I tell people, if you want to understand what Cyberstorm 1 was like, I'm thinking this is back in 2006. So this is going back to the first Cyberstorm, but there's a lot of, of really good lessons we learned from that. Um, watch the movie Die Hard 4. Die Hard 4 with uh, Bruce Willis. Um, it's called Live Free and Die Hard, where all the power goes out and bombs are going off, and it's scary stuff. Um, so we had a situation where um, we, you know, the first day of this exercise, you know, it was probably over the top, and most cyber exercises today wouldn't start this way, but they had bombs going off, kind of like 9-11 again. They blew up our data center. They blew up um, a big parts of government. Um, they hacked other parts of government, and all of our services were down for two days, and it was very, very intense. And we were like getting beat up. We were like humbled. Our team was just like, we were like done. I mean, we were really kind of overwhelmed. By Thursday afternoon, though, this is what I want to tell you about. By Thursday afternoon, we were told there's one more thing you have to do in this exercise to train your team.